Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. So uh, I'm just tweeting now because this is uh, the tweet saying go and watch it on the live stream. Anybody out there, I hope you're paying attention. Um, I'm just delighted to be here. So I am a board member of YTH. Uh, you may ask yourself, actually I frequently do ask myself, why the hell am I a board member at YTH? You know, obviously back in the day I thought the sex tag was a great conference about online pornography and was very disappointed to find out when I finally came what it was really about. Um, <laughs> I'm also the person who, at the early uh, sex tech, uh, got very confused because I'm a bit of a political junkie. And you know, in the in the in the blog world, we're always going on about the uh, the mainstream media. And I was very confused to find out what MSM meant here. It meant something very different. <laughs> the, well, I, I was very confused about the behaviour of the mainstream media in, in this context. I tell you. Um, <laughs> Obviously, I went to school in the UK in the 1970s. Uh, I went to an all-boys boarding school, so you can imagine that my sex education all happened behind the bike sheds. Mm -hmm. Luckily, there were no women, so it didn't actually you know, matter for the <laughs> spreading pregnancy or, the, or it's heterosexual disease. Um, but uh, it's, it's odd that I'm here. But the reason I'm here is not because I know anything about this topic, but because uh, Health 2.0, which is the organization I founded with Indu Sabaya, um, it has for the last ooh, seven or so years been looking at promoting and trying to figure out ways that new technologies um, could change the healthcare system. So the chart I'm showing you right now is kind of a global view of how we think of the world of Health 2.0. If you stay way over on the left there, you see all different types of data. And as Suzanne mentioned, this data is, is starting to come from greater and greater numbers of sources, not the least of which are the uh, cell phones and the uh, iPads um, and the computers that you're all holding in, in your hands as you ignore what I'm saying, or, or hopefully tweet about it. Um, but also from all different types of other sources, there has been a huge growth in the last uh, few years, actually, just in this country, but it's spreading internationally, in government sources of data being opened up. In particular, the uh, HHS under Todd Park and under Brian Sivak um, are opening up a lot of government data sets, um, and we're seeing even private data sets being opened up for developers to work on. Um, quick plug and pure self-interest, Health 2.0 is having a, a conference called Health Refactored, Later in May, you may want to Google that. If you're a developer or designer, you're interested in that, in that, in that type of world, um, come see me. If you're feeling poor, I might be able to give you a discount. And then our friends at the California Healthcare Foundation are sponsoring a conference uh, which we're working with them on. Um, so the Health Refactor one is May the 13th to 14th. Hope I get that right. Sophie in the audience, you will look at me if I get it wrong, right? And then uh, the, the Healthier Communities Data Summit which is a one-day piece about open data for um, sort of public health. May interest some of you. That's in San Francisco on May the 26th. I hope I got those all right. So a lot of conferences, a lot of interest around the whole world of data. There's a big one in DC called the Health, uh, health Data Palooza, which is in early June. So the whole world of data is really exploding, both in terms of the private sector producing data, individuals producing data, all the cell phones and the sensors and the computers we're, we're holding on. And then there's a whole group of companies emerging to create what we call a data utility layer. These are folks like Microsoft Health Vault, uh, Desir, which Dave Goldsmith for the Frontier is just about to join, and others who are basically taking ways that if you have an application, you have a device, you can plug that into um, this data utility layer and store data there and move it into other applications. So you're really seeing a revolution in how healthcare data is, is moving around. Traditionally, healthcare data has been very, very locked into silos, one system with one database. Um, and it's very hard to move data around. That's still unfortunately the case for most healthcare data, but uh, the, the new technology from the rest of the world is getting, is getting there slowly. Then of course we have this thing on the right called unplatforms. Uh, this is my personal bugbear. I absolutely hate the term mHealth or mobile health. If anyone uses that term, term near me, expect to get slapped, even if you are the uh, president and uh, CEO of the whole organization, Deb. Um, <laughs> because mHealth means that you need to develop only for this thing, the cell phone. And in reality, as a developer or as a service, you have to be in everywhere. We had this conversation fantastically exemplified yesterday at the plenary session when everyone was talking about TV, right? What do kids do? They use TV. What do old people do? They watch TV. If you want to be in front of people and relevant with healthcare and your applications, you have to see what applications can run on TVs and smart TVs, as well as computers, as well as cell phones, as well as every other screen, body sensors. It's all going to explode, and the data coming from that is, is, is going to be a big, big part of the future. And what's happening is all that data is being collected and being spat back out into what we call these unplatforms. Everyone hates this term, no one uses it, but it's basically that collection of devices, applications, and data sets that are all coming together at the point of care. And the goal here, 
for all of us in this room, whether you're talking about sexual health, domestic violence, uh, general health, whatever it is, is to get to a better decision, right? A better decision and a better action on the right hand side. And uh, BJ Fogg from, uh, from the behavior change world at Stanford talks about making small, easily doable changes. And I think that's what you've got to think about as you're building tools and using data is how you can get to that. So I'm going to shut up about my stuff and instead show you other people's stuff because uh, there are much cooler things to be done, I hope. There we go. No, maybe there we go, right somewhere. So I'm going to show you just a few examples of different types of... Did I leave my piece of paper over there? What did I bring it with me? Ah. My old friend Fard brings me the cheat sheet, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to show you a few examples of people who are using data for really interesting ways. And then you're going to see two larger examples on the stage after me. But what we do at Health 2.0 is we have, literally, we have something in the order of about 150 people, uh, companies, organizations, doing live demos on our stage. Um, and all our multiple stages. We have about a couple of thousand people at our main conference. And really, it's an extraordinary amount of work from our team to get all these people prepped so they all give great four and a half minute demos. And I'm just going to show you a couple of those. But before I'm going to do that, I'm going to show you something else, which is that Health 2.0 also works with many organizations, not the least of which is the HHS and the federal government, to run developer challenges. And here is a winner of a developer challenge. This one actually is a really great example of what you might call big data of different types of data sets being used uh, in a mapping function. You're going to see another one of these in, in a little bit um, from Patrick. But this is a team called the Community Commons. And they have taken all the Healthy People 2020 data, which is all kinds of stuff. And you'll see some examples of that, and mapped it in a way that a researcher can find some really interesting stuff. So I'm going to show you this video. And there should be some sound. Or did I kill the sound? Maybe not. With thousands of local initiatives which are an array of multi-sector partnerships and coalitions. On the left, you can search by focus area or strategy, as well as state or funding source. Click here to see if your local initiative is a good fit for the map of the movement. One of the most exciting components on the Commons is this powerful database. With over 7,000 GIS data layers, this is the most current comprehensive single source of such data in the nation. This is an unprecedented spectrum of children and youth, civic engagement, crime, demographic, education, environmental health, and poverty data, which allows you to create your own custom maps. Maps are a valuable tool in advancing your local community improvement efforts. All right, so that's just a quick example of how the, the new tools allow you to take masses and reams of information, big data, and create valuable maps like this one, which is around the, this one particular one's about farmers markets and uh, food oases, but you can imagine doing the same thing. I, I tried to build a map yesterday and failed, but it was going to have rape statistics and domestic violence, and there's just all kinds of stuff in this database. It's called Community Commons. I encourage you to go and, and check it out. Um, it was a set of winner of uh, one of our challenges. Um, next, I'm going to show you something which is dealing with a huge, 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 huge data stream that we are suffering through right now. So aren't we supposed to be switching over to it in the middle? This is a company called Fountain. Um, this is a guy called Adam Selilak, who is uh, one of those incredibly annoying 22-year-old sort of geniuses um, who, is, uh, who, who figured out how to take really amazing stuff out of something that we're all using. Actually, who's not using... I won't embarrass the people who are not tweeting in the room, but, you know... Um, this is a way, again, of taking data out of, out of Twitter. I'm going to try and be clever and go to two places in this video, so I may screw it up. But here we go. So here we are in San Francisco, and you're looking at the map. And we are here at the, at the blue dot. And you can zoom in and out and, and play with this map. And what our system did automatically is they labeled all the recent tweets around you, around us in, in the city. And so we look at the language, what people say and how they interact. And we automatically label them as either sick or not sick based on the language. So we can look at some examples here. So if you click on these tweets, it actually opens up a window. And so this lady said, I've been sick for 10 days. Doctor says, uh, write it out. But I'm running out of time. And she's asking for advice on what to do. So you get the impression here, right? So all those tweets, they have a very cool natural language tool, which is going into Twitter, taking that far hose of tweets, putting it down by area where the tweet location is, and then figuring out what's going on. And they're able to distinguish between you know, some guy saying, dude, that's sick. 
I'm a good teenager, aren't I? No, apparently not. Um, you know, versus I actually am sick, right? And then they're going to give it a score. And you'll see in a second, as I, go f as I wind forward here, if I can get to the right spot, a little bit more, you'll, you'll see in a second how you can actually add to this, you can actually add this to yourself. And then what it all looks health. like when you rotate a heat map. So by sliding the slider from physically feeling horrible to feeling awesome. And if, you, if it looks like there's something wrong with you, we even adaptively ask you to tell some of your symptoms. So if you wish, we'll keep track of this for you. We'll record your location, what kind of symptoms you had, how did you feel at that location. And we provide the context, the people who you likely met at that place, and how did they impact your health. And now we can actually measure these signals at a population scale. So he's describing here the concept of health Now if we switch from the individual view to a heat map view, so now we are looking Communicable at diseases like cold. the sickness density of, of people in New York City. And, so, and I can switch from this high contrast view. So this is like a day in New York City. And so basically you want to avoid the hot spots here. Those are the places where there's a lot of Twitter users that, that are sick, right? Who, who, who is in Manhattan here? New York City. It's surprising you're still alive. <laughs> 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 so that's just another example of taking incredible amount of volumes of data, finding inferences and new ways to think about that data inside the data stream itself. So that's, uh, uh, that's the, and I'm going to show you two more. And the first one is going to be more about health data. I know I'm running, how, I'm way over time as I babbled on. Oh, good God. Right, I'm still, I'm, I'm going to run over time and I'll, you'll shut me up later. Okay. Um, all right. No, you have to see two because it doesn't, my speech doesn't make sense. You don't see two. All right. This one's really quick. Okay. There's only, uh, there's only uh, about 30 seconds of this one. In clinical this is a guy called Charlie Lothian from Explorers. This, this data set fits. brings in a ton all de -identified. So it's easy of to be different data, at claims data, medical data, claims data, um, lab data, about millions of patients, enables you to drill down as a medical researcher or a clinician into and very precise but still very large numbers of people who have had different types of treatments like age, to figure out what works and what doesn't. Or race. But it also lets me look at other things that I might be missing. Gaps in care, for instance, such as screenings for things that are really important, like cancer. All right, so the, the, so the last one, I'm going to change gears and instead talk to you about something that I think is about small data. So everything you've seen at this point has been really huge volumes of data. But this is a very small, this is a small amount of data set. This is one clinic with, with a few hundred patients. And instead of having to get inferences from this huge data store, what Fitel here, Guy Monsanto, is showing you is how you would actually just, if you knew a few little things, how could you change behavior? It's an actual person or a function. Uh, so this is the kind of data that uh, Feichel takes from a clinic. It's 17 providers, uh, 17 individual clinicians in this clinic, uh, to all that together. Patients. Um, and what they've been able to do own. here is take two very so simple care measures that he's going to show in. you here, a population an summary. Of how a care manager might, um, there we go. That is all the patients of the population. clinic on one screen. So here is on the left I can is see my, uh, body mass index, how trouble they are, like me. Uh, on the right uh, is uh, cholesterol EMI levels, LDL. And, LDL cholesterol. and using these tools, I can see using how tool, an individual you can see each individual. He's picking up one there. patient by name. And, and then you can do something about it. You can select a group and then say, okay, now I actually want to do an action, right? So I want to actually want to patients, create a, in this case, I'm going to create a list of them, them and I want someone to happen. In this case, going to email them all and get them onto what they're calling their get fit program. In the, uh, system. So that's not complicated big data. That's taking some of what we know. We know if people are overweight and if they have high cholesterol, we should do something about it. But can we make an intervention and can we do some behavior change based on that? So I want you to think about the world of big data, but also think about how do you usefully use small data, and I apologize for going over. No, thank you. Thank you so much for giving.